Hi, we're continuing our study about Daniel and learning that our life, just like Daniel's, is full of ups and downs, good news, bad news. We go from day to day, everything seems to be wonderful, and then out of nowhere, we get slammed with something that just makes our world seem like it's falling apart. That's what happened to Daniel. Chapter 1 ended with good news. Daniel was promoted. The king found Daniel and his three friends to be ten times wiser than all of the magicians and the astrologers and all the other wise men. And from that day on, Daniel was promoted. Daniel stayed with the king as a counselor, not just through Nebuchadnezzar, but all the way through King Cyrus, even after the Babylonian Empire ended. Oh, wow. You think everything's great. But just like us, he had a lot of those in-between times, a lot of those bad days, good days. And that's exactly how chapter 2 starts. The good news of being promoted in chapter 1 is followed by the bad news. King Nebuchadnezzar was not happy. It says, now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's Rain, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was troubled so that his sleep left him. He said, wait a minute, I thought Nebuchadnezzar had already been king. No, in the first chapter, he ruled as a subordinate with his father. Now, we're at the second year that King Nebuchadnezzar was ruling as the sole sovereign. And the king had a dream, and he was troubled because he did not know the future of his kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar ruled a vast empire. And the dream so troubled him that he called all of the wise men of Babylon, the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans, and demanded that they tell him the dream as well as the interpretation, or else they would face execution for the fraud that he probably suspected them of all along. Now, who were these men? What were these four classes? Well, the magicians were those involved in divination or dream interpretation. So they certainly should have been able to know how to do it. Astrologers, well, they studied the stars and performed all kinds of incantations and should have been able to put him under trance and get the information out of him. The sorcerers, they received their powers from evil spirits and used incantations to practice sorcery and witchcraft. The Chaldeans, these were the most distinguished caste of all the priests of the wise men, and they probably held all the secrets of the Babylonian religion. And in chapter 2, verse 27, it, it tells us he, that he also called in a fifth group which were the soothsayers. And these men would guess a man's future by his, the place of the stars at his birth. So here he is. He's got all five of these people or these groups of people. And he says, tell me the dream. Oh, wow. You know what? He said, not only do I want you to tell it to me, if you don't tell it to me and you tell me what it means... You're going to be in trouble. I'm going to kill you. <gasps> they said, King, you tell us the dream, and we will tell you the interpretation. That's all you have to do. You just tell us what it is, and we'll tell you what it means. They, this made Daniel and his friends, who were thoroughly trained in wisdom in all the ages, stand out because they didn't fall for all of this. Even though they had been thoroughly trained in all of this, they were not gullible to any of their doctrines. And so when the revelation comes from God, it really puts Daniel and his Hebrew friends on a different level. And in verses 5 through 9 of chapter 2, the king threatened death if they didn't tell him. But he said, don't worry. I'll reward you if you can. And 
Nebuchadnezzar said that his decision was firm and that nothing they could do would change it. They'd been accused probably of lying in the past, maybe even caught in some of those lies. And he said, you're only trying to stall so that you can tell me, so that I'll tell you the dream and you'll come up with something to make me feel good. But verses 10 and 11, we see that unbelievers know their limitation because the Chaldeans answered, there is not a man on earth who can tell the king's manner. No lord or ruler has ever asked such a thing of any mag magician, astrologer, or Chaldean, and there is no other who can tell the king except the gods whose dwelling is in heavens. Oh, yes, they were exactly right about that. God had these unbelievers with their own words condemn how ineffective, how useless their pretense of supernatural knowledge was. And this made a greater display of God's secrets through his servant Daniel, who was just like them, a man who lived on earth. Well, in verses 12 and 13, we see that Testing comes because of association. And you know what that means for us? We need to keep good company. Nebuchadnezzar declared that all the wise men of Babylon should be killed. He said, every one of them. And so Daniel and his friends went to the top of the Babylon's most wanted list. For some reason that we don't know, Daniel and his companions were not summoned before the king along with all the other wise men. God had it planned this way, though. He had it planned so that every avenue of human wisdom, of all of the other ways that they would come out through sorcery, witchcraft, all of that would be proven useless. And then... After that, he displayed his divine power through his servant, Daniel. So there's good news coming. We've been through the bad news, but now we've got some good news coming. In verses 14 through 16, respect authority and God will give you grace. Verse 14 starts out then with counsel and wisdom. Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. Why is this decree from the king so urgent? Arioch made the decision known to Daniel, and Daniel asked the king to give him time that he might tell the interpretation. Daniel sets out for us a great example of how we should approach authority. He acted respectfully. He said, can, can you tell me what the problem is? He didn't go in, look, I wasn't there. I didn't have anything to do with this. I don't follow any of that. I serve God and no, no. He said, would you tell me what the problem is? Why is this happening? And this lets us know that Daniel had no clue of what was going on. He was not involved up to this point. Then he acted respectfully. And he went through the proper channels. It said that once he found out what the problem was, that he made an appeal to the king. And he didn't challenge anyone's authority or position. He didn't say, wait a minute, you can't do this to me. Or he didn't say, king, remember what you, no. It, it was all with a very submissive and a humble heart. Wisdom and tact saved innocent lives. If you want to keep your head, keep your head. That would be Daniel's advice to you today. Daniel was ignorant of the matter until now, but now that he's discovered what it, what it is, he asked for time. And the king granted Daniel time. 
because even though the Chaldeans had asked for it and he said no, Daniel did not ask for the king's interpretation. He says, you give me time. Let me consult. You know, give me time and I will come up with the answer. And the king did that. Well, we got some bad news here, though. You know, the good news was God gave him time. But the bad news is faith doesn't mean you know it all. In verses 2 through 17, Daniel realized that he was in trouble. And he realized the importance of group prayer. You know, be friends with those who can pray when trouble comes. The reason that Daniel wanted time was so he could pray. He did not have the answer. Have you ever backed yourself into a corner? Put yourself in a position so that if God did not come through, you were sunk? That's exactly where Daniel was. And after committing himself to reveal the dream and its interpretation, Daniel knew he had to pray. And he called Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, you know, those guys known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah, he called them to his house to pray with him. And despite all of Daniel's wisdom and education, he knew that in a crisis, Prayer was the only answer. And so Daniel and his friends were seeking mercy from God concerning the dream. Why? So that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. They were not praying for the king, but they were praying for their personal safety. I said, God, save us. Show us so that we can live. Because for them and the Chaldeans, it was a matter of life and death. And this indicates that the Hebrews were seen and known as a part of those wise men. Well, the bad news was Daniel didn't have the answer. But good news. God answers specific prayer specifically. In verses 19 through 23, when Daniel and his friends prayed for God to reveal the, the interpretation, the answer was immediate. In Matthew 18, verses 19 through 20, it tells us that, you know, when two or three are gathered, where two or three agree as touching anything on earth that shall be done, and then verse 20 says, where two or three are gathered in my name there in the midst of my. So here we have not two or three, but we got four people gathered, four people praying. And they're believing God. They're going into intercessory prayer, prayer for themselves, prayer for the Chaldeans, prayer for the nations, but specifically for themselves in this interpretation. And God comes through. God answers prayer. And when God gives the answer, what does Daniel do? He said, oh, let's go tell the king. No, no. As urgent as it was to have all the killing stopped, what does Daniel take time to do? He takes time to praise the Lord that re who revealed his understanding. God is magnified. And Daniel says, oh, God, I know who you are. And he praised God's total power and knowledge and omnipotence. He praised his revelation of this divine knowledge and strength. And because God controls all of humanity. Daniel indicates in this prayer that the dream concerns the changes of the kingdoms, their times and their seasons are not in the hands of fate as all of the Babylonians said, but the hands and the seasons and times are controlled by God alone. Daniel gives all glory to God. God showed himself strong on his behalf. And Daniel's 
said, whatever ability I have to stop the execution of the king's cruel decree, it is your gift to me. You have given me wisdom and might and have made known to me what we ask of you, for you have made known to us the king's demand. Wait a minute. Me, we, us? I thought it was just Daniel talking and praising God. No. The revelation was given to Daniel, as the me implies, yet with humility. He joins his friends with him and, and says, hey, it was not just me. It was because of our joint prayers and not just his individual ones that he owned the, the, owed this revelation from God. So he's taking care of that. He has praised God. Now he's got to get on and do first things first. He doesn't march right into the king. Still, even though he's praised God, he doesn't go straight to Nebuchadnezzar. No, he went back to Arioch and he said, stop the execution. Don't let anyone else die. I've got the answer. In the midst of all of this and knowing that his very life was on the line. He took time to think about others. Then he asked permission for an interview with the king. And in verses 26 through 28, we see Daniel giving God the credit. That interview with the king was granted. And the king said, Daniel, can you tell me what I dreamed? Can you tell me the meaning of it? And Daniel answered, the secret which the king demanded, the wise men, astrologers, magicians, soothsayers, they cannot declare it to the king. Daniel, because he had been learned and taught in all the ways of the Chaldeans, he could declare with all authority that it was impossible for any man on earth to know the king's secrets. He said, only the true and living God who dwells in heaven, can give me the interpretation. Then, you know, we go through a time, you know, we got good news, bad news, but then you ever go through a time that you just sort of scratch your head and wonder, why God? Why, why that person? Why is this happening? That had to be where Daniel was now with his confusing with this confusing news and Daniel had to learn a same the same lesson we have to learn and that is don't discount God's message because of the messenger let me explain it a little more in verses 29 and 30 of chapter 2 it says that God honored Nebuchadnezzar, and that his dream revealed future events and God's coming action in history. Wait a minute. Nebuchadnezzar is not an Israelite. He's a foreign king. And on top of that, that makes matters even worse. He's an unbelieving foreign king. And he kills the Jews. He burns Jerusalem. He takes the people captive. And now, God, you're going to honor him and tell him what's going on in the future? We've today, we have good, believing, honorable, godly Christians who are praying to know the future and the times and the seasons and when God is going to do something and God's not speaking to them or us, but God spoke to this king, to this Nebuchadnezzar. Doesn't make sense. And Daniel could have just discounted the dream because of the messenger that God used to send it. And we've got to realize that God uses whomever he chooses. And why is this important? Sometimes 
God might use a very unlovable, unlikely person to speak a truth into your life. He might use someone that you look at and say, how could God ever speak to them? I know what kind of life they live. And they're trying to tell me? Well, just like Daniel with Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel realized from firsthand experience the kind of man that Nebuchadnezzar was, but he knew that this dream was from God. And he knew that God was speaking through this dream to give a revelation of the end times. It was an explanation of future events. And God gave the dream and gave the revelation, the interpretation to Daniel for two reasons. Once of them, and foremost in Daniel's mind, of course, was so that Daniel and his friends could live. That was most important. And secondly, he gave the revelation just so Nebuchadnezzar would understand the dream. Nebuchadnezzar was concerned about his kingdom. And God says, I want, I want you to understand. And so verses 31 through 46 are an explanation of the dream and all the future events. Daniel explained that the king's dream concerned an image made of different material from gold at the top all the way down to clay toes. And we are not going to talk about that. It would take a long time. What we're talking about here are discipleship lessons from Daniel. And Daniel revealed that the image had to do with Nebuchadnezzar's mighty kingdom and what would happen to it in the future. Then what Daniel did, he gave the ultimate reason for the dream. He said, Nebuchadnezzar king, this is what you dreamed. This is what it means. But this is why you dreamed it. Because God wants you to know that following the destruction of that image, that the God of heaven, the creator of all, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, he will set up a kingdom that will continue forever and ever, an everlasting kingdom. And good news. That is good news. It's not bad news. It's not confusing news. It's good news. And the good news, too, follows with the results of the dream in verses 46 through 49. You see... That dream provided comfort for Daniel and for all the Israelites. Hey, all of this wickedness that we're going through now, it's not going to last forever, but God will. Then, secondly, it served as a warning to Nebuchadnezzar. As powerful as he was, or at least... And in his mind, as invincible as he thought he might be, he was not the all-powerful one. God is. The third thing it did was it introduced God, Nebuchadnezzar to the true God. Nebuchadnezzar even made the statement, you are the God of gods. Now, this confession did not mean that Nebuchadnezzar was converted, that he was turning his life over to God, that he was becoming a believer. No, it didn't mean any of that. But because the Lord gave Daniel the power to interpret dreams, he was willing to admit that Daniel's God was supreme over all the gods of Babylon, at least in the matter of knowledge. And for a time, he said, yes. But then, number four, good news. It gave Daniel prominence in the kingdom. He was rewarded with riches, but more than that, with position. He became the chief counselor 
to Nebuchadnezzar and was placed all over all the other wise men. That's a pretty big promotion. And then the fifth one, one that we sometimes overlook, Daniel talked to the king about his friends. Remember those three Hebrews that had been with him through the fast, that had been with him in prayer? He said, will you give them a place? Will you give them a position? And so they were all over the providence of Babylon. What we see here is unseen prayer brings reward. Well, Today we've seen a life filled with ups and downs, good news, bad news, and I hope that you'll recognize that your life is like that. And even in the times that are hard, God is with you. He promises to be with you. And next week, we're going to look at these three Hebrew guys again. And they have moved on to the names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's how they're going to be known now. And they're going to go through the fire, but through it all, you're going to see the goodness of God. 